Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for your patience. My name is Barry Colfer. I'm the Director of Research here at the IIA. Absolutely thrilled to have Carson Stower here to speak to us about development assistance in a changing world. That's all I have to do because it's my pleasure to, to invite Michael Gaffey from Irish Aid to give a couple of opening remarks. Michael. Great, thank you very much. If I can keep my introduction as brief as that, I'll be doing I'll be doing really, really well. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here on the latest of the uh, Development Matters series of lectures with the IIEA, which we, in collaboration with Irish Aid, it's a really good forum for us over recent years in bringing uh, significant and influential figures in the world of development to speak uh, in Dublin. Um, I have to say, it is a real honor and a pleasure to have the guest today, Karsten Starr. It feels, I should first of all say, it feels like a bit like an old ambassadors club standing up here because um, Karsten has been ambassador to the UN in New York. When I went as ambassador to the UN in Geneva, he was the Danish ambassador. And of course, David was the um, Irish ambassador to the UN in New York and the father of the SDGs. So we'll just set all that um, ex-diplomacy uh, aside because Carson is here today as the chair of the Development Assistance Committee of the OECD. And the DAC is a um, really important, influential uh, organization. He was elected uh, chair about a year ago. He's in his first year. He's making a real impact. Uh, and I would say that the world today, as we say constantly, is in a state of multiple overlapping crises. And uh, the place of ODA, of official development assistance, in helping in the response to some of those crises or to that polycrisis situation is, is a subject of huge debate at the moment. Uh, I think in Ireland um, and probably across the world, the debate on whether we need to have ODA anymore has, has finished, I think. The focus now is on how do we use ODA? Uh, it's not going to solve all our problems, but it is a very significant piece, resource of voted government expenditure. Um, and uh, the DAC, the Development Assistance Committee, is the custodian of ODA. The rules for ODA, how it works, and, and how consensus can be reached uh, on that. So uh, I attended last week the DAC high-level meeting in Paris, uh, and it was actually a really important two days of discussion on the place of development in our world uh, today and on how we can use and apply ODA as effectively as possible. So I want to say Karsten uh, has already met with our senior management group this morning uh, and given us a really, really clear and interesting sort of analysis of how he sees the world today and, and, how, and, and, and how we deploy uh, ODA in it. So rather than me going on any more about that, I just want to welcome Karsten and uh, look forward to a really good discussion uh, with him this morning. Thank you very much, Karsten Starr. Uh Michael, thank, thank you as ever. And just echoing your remarks, it's it, it's really wonderful, Carson, to have this opportunity to uh, welcome you to, to Ireland. Um, not your first time, I think. Uh, you've had a, an illustrious career, and Michael and I were privileged to be able to work with you at different points um, when you were State Secretary for International Development Cooperation in Denmark. Um, I, we worked closely, and then later in your various UN roles, and indeed other colleagues worked with you while you were Danish ambassador to the OECD. And now uh, you've uh, ascended, as it were, to this crucial role. And um, uh, we're all delighted that that a, a friend is there and, and somebody who whom we value greatly. A few housekeeping points before I ask Carsten to take the floor. First, um, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on the Zoom. Uh, please feel free to... Uh, to send in questions throughout the session as they occur to you or observations or challenges or whatever. Um, and uh, we'll come to them after Austin has finished his presentation. A reminder that the, um, the, the both his presentation and the Q&A will be on the record. Uh, please feel free to join the discussion on, on Twitter or, or, or X um, uh, using the handle at IIEA. Um, we've also, we're also live streaming the discussion uh, today. So with that, Carson, once again, a very warm welcome from the IIEA and uh, over to you. 
Thank you. I, I might uh, please. Yeah. I might I might stand up here just to 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 make it a bit more informal. Uh, just to to say thank you very much for the invitation and for for this honor and opportunity to be here and to say a few words. Um, I uh, have worked closely with Ireland in a number of occasions, not least in the Global Fund. Nicola Brennan, I think she's now in, in Addis, uh, was a good colleague in, in the Global Fund board, where we both represented what the group that was called Point Seven. That was aspirational on part of Ireland. It was more matter of fact in part of Denmark. Uh, but 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 basically, uh, we worked in Nordic countries plus uh, Netherlands, UK, Luxembourg, not not the UK, Ireland, Netherlands, and Luxembourg with the Nordics in a, in one of the ten constituencies on the donor side, and it was a real pleasure to to work with 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 you on that. If you look at the OECD DAC and on on, on development cooperation on ODA from the outside you can say that this is a success story. Last year, 2022, we had the highest ODA ever, more than the first time we passed the $200 billion mark, $204 billion, up $18 billion to, compared to 21. 0.36% of GNI, the highest number that we have had for since 1986. So basically, a success story is in many ways. ODA is as strong as it has ever been. The DAC itself, uh, I think, is also a success story in the way that we do rulemaking, in the way that we do data, and the way that we do analysis, in the way that we create peer learning environments uh, for member states to, to work on. So basically, a good story and an easy job. On the other hand, uh, there are some real challenges out there that I think we, 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 we need to be aware of and where we basically need to start discussing, and some of them we have been discussing for some time. ODA is $200 billion a year, but there's a lot of pressure on it. We see uh, pressure from humanitarian assistance. Gaza right now is providing a lot of pressure uh, on ODA budgets uh, to deal with the present emergencies, of course, and there will be a discussion about reconstruction coming up very soon, hopefully. Then we have uh, pressure on Ukraine, biggest recipient of ODA from Ireland, from Denmark, from a number of other countries uh, in 2022. Uh, we have the pressure from in-donor refugee costs, which are huge in 2022. You saw half of the Irish budget is in-donor refugee costs. For other countries, it's not necessarily all that, but it's a significant part. 14.4% of total ODA 2022 was in donor refugee costs, most of it from Ukraine and in Europe. We have seen a lot of pressure on COVID-19, the whole issue of uh, vaccine donations. We have seen the knock-on effects uh, of, of COVID-19 in the economic circumstances of countries. We have seen only 12% of the SDGs being on track uh, when we had the, uh, the discussions in New York in September. We will not go uh, to be in a situation where we can see we have lived up to the SDGs when we are in 2030. The only question right now is how close will we get? And we need to get as close as possible. Um, we see um, uh, climate change uh, coming up. Part of that, a large part of that uh, assistance to, to mitigate and to adapt to climate change will be ODA or is ODA. Uh, but there's also pressure of moving more ODA into the work of climate change mitigation and adaptation than in what has been traditional focus of ODA in social sectors, in health education, social protections, and so on. So there's a lot of pressures on, on the envelope of ODA from a number of sources. At the same time, we, we see uh, competing models of cooperation emerging. China is not a big provider of ODA, but it, it's a big provider of finance. A lot of it, of course, uh, capital that's lent out at co on commercial terms, uh, huge importance to Africa in recent years. And we have seen the Belt and Road Initiative, we've seen the Global Development Initiative from, from the Chinese side, in the sense that that, that provides, and we've seen as providing, uh, an alternative to the traditional donor role of the West. It's not entirely so, and I do think that there are ways of also where we can also cooperate, but in, in very much also seen that in a way that, that it is uh, basically a competing model. 
we will never get to a new Cold War situation where we have two different systems uh, opposing each other, but we will get to a situation where there will be tensions in some areas and cooperation in others, uh, and then we need, that's something that we need uh, to, to to deal with. We uh, also see uh, pressure on trade patterns. Uh, when we had a 30 years of, of ODA driven by Cold War from 1960 to 1990, then we went into a mode of globalization. Globalization was the driver of our ODA narrative. We wanted developing countries to join the global economy to grow through integration into the, the uh, international trade and to have uh, export-led economic growth. That was dependent on free, open uh, trade uh, in, in the world. We are in a slightly different situation now. We talk about home shoring, near shoring, French shoring, strategic autonomy, we talk about uh, shortening supply chains. Uh, we talk about more resilience in our supply chain. So there's a lot of, ch of change in the way that we look at trade. Um, and it, it, it all boils down to uh, maybe a new look on, on, on markets and where uh, we should uh, solicit from. Uh, companies, where should their suppliers be? Um, and we see a number of interest in 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 maybe getting closer to uh, Europe in in our case and in your case uh, and also to to move to to new markets and that's was where Africa will become a, a big issue in, in the discussions in the years to come. And finally, we see a criticism of ODA in the way that we account uh, for ODA. I think 90% of all ODA is grants, and that's fairly easy to account for. But we do have uh, some part of ODA, which is uh, related to loans, to debt uh, forgiveness. Uh, and there has been a discussion about that. Uh, and uh, we, we, we basically are in a situation now where we, where we also have to address that, that kind of criticism. So under the, the, the surface of a great success, there are some challenges that we need to address in the, in the years to come. And we're quite aware of that. And the high-level meeting that Michael alluded to last week has also set an agenda for how to address some of these points in, in time. Now, what to do? And I'll try to be brief here, and we can elaborate on that during the Q&A. But for me, it's very clear that we need to increase LBA. 36% overall is good. It's better than for a long time but it's not enough. And it's especially not enough if we use ODA for a lot of sideshow, so to speak. Uh, additional uh, aid to Ukraine, I don't know, it, Ukraine is not the typical developing country. It is a European middle income country that happens to be on the ODA eligibility list, uh, but it is not a typical country for, for what, what is, is meant historically by by ODA. And so it, I think it is important that our assistance to Ukraine become additional. It may not be possible in the forum, but I think we have to, as we did in 2022, to be able to say that most of our, addition, our assistance to Ukraine has been additional. It was clear, if you look at it overall for 2022, that is something that we can say. Not all of it, not for all countries, but as, a, as an average, the most, majority of our assistance to Ukraine was additional in last year. So that's that's really important. What is also important is that we, we don't get into a situation where we can say that Africa is going to pay for Ukraine. Again, look at the numbers for 22, the provisional numbers. There's a fall in bilateral assistance for Africa overall of around 7%. It may be corrected when we get the final numbers just before Christmas, but but there was basically a story out there that 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 can say that for a certain part, Africa did actually pay for the assistance to Ukraine, and that is not, I think, what we want, where we want to see ODA, and that's not a, a situation that is politically conducive. So, we we have to be sure that we can increase ODA. We can also increase within ODA our assistance to Africa. And we should not get into a situation where we're forced to choose between increased military expenditures and increased ODA. It is not, and I think that may be the most important political message here, it is not an either or, it is a both and. 
There are a number of huge pressure on our security in parts of the world, including in Europe. There's a good reason to increase military spending, defense spending, uh, due to the threat uh, which is Russia poses in, in, in our neighborhood. But it should not be at the expense of, of, of our possibilities to, to increase OD. And I think that hopefully will be a key important uh, political issue in, in the time to come. The other issue that we have is the allocation of ODA. The pressure right now is very much on more support for middle-income countries. The World Bank reform, the MDB reform, the um, pressure that we now get to, to provide more funding for the international development bank financing system is basically going to be a lot of uh, pressure to provide money for middle-income countries. We also see when we get to a new surge in, in our support for debt relief, which will come, that will also happen to be, presumably, for a number of middle-income countries. So the pressure is there. Middle-income countries uh, are, fat, are battling with a lot of challenges in terms of climate change mitigation, uh, in terms of uh, dealing with uh, all sorts of all sorts of problems geopolitically and, and economically. And of course, uh, the the, the the, the political pressure from this group of countries, I'm sure, will, will only increase in the time to come. In that situation, I think it, we really need to look into uh, the or to, to try to defend and, and protect our support for low-income countries for LDCs, uh, which traditionally has been uh, the the, uh, the recipients of of ODA. ODA is much more economically important for low-income countries than it is for mid low middle-income countries. Uh, I think a lot, a lot of, I think up to ten percent of of uh, GNI in low income countries actually emanates from uh, ODA, where it's less than one percent if you look at lower middle income countries. So the economic importance of ODA is quite strikingly different in the poorer countries than it is in the middle income countries, and the effect of ODA, potential effect of ODA, is also increasing in 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 uh, in, in low income countries. And there's no doubt that we then we need to change the way that we do business. There has been a lot of discussion at the high level meeting last week that we need to listen more, we need to stay engaged, we need to uh, build more on locally led development, we need to to be more flexible in the way we adapt to changing political situations, economic situations in ODA, and and there's maybe at some point in time, some people say that they have to be less paternalistic in the way we do business. And I think that is really, really important. We've tried to do that for a long time, but we have not finished that that job and we need to to reinforce the way that we tr try to create partnerships with our, with our partner countries. We also uh, need to look a uh, little bit more deeply into the role of ODA. ODA, ODA has always been a catalyst for change. We try to move, uh, we try to help countries do the reforms they need to do and they want to do by way of ODA. So we we invest in, in, in change, we invest in reform. We have a lot of focus now on investing more in domestic resource mobilization and tax systems and creating revenues in countries for them to themselves to be able to uh, to increase their investment in, in health, education, social protection, and other main important, politically important issues. Um, and that still, that using ODA to create an enabling environment for growth and for development will still be a very key factor in the way that we do ODA. But we have an increasing discussion about ODA in mobilization, leveraging ODA, making sure that we can use ODA to generate more private investment, more private finance and development. We do that through, and you, Ireland is not in that club that has uh, uh, development finance institutions, but half of the DAC members actually do that. Uh, so there's a growing interest, and that's the reason that we had a lot of discussion in recent years on private sector instruments. How can we use ODA to raise private fund? How can we de-risk? How, how can we in other ways try to be helpful to overcome some of the obstacles for private finance in, in developing countries so that we can actually do what we need to do. Even though ODA is $200 billion, even if it's a record number, it's a small part, 5% maybe, of the total financial needs in developing countries. If you look at the SDG business and if you look at the climate change the calculations, you see numbers in the classes of trillions. ODA is a small part of that. And ODA can never, it was never meant to fill that gap. 
countries to have, have themselves have to mobilize. Private sector has to play an important role in mobilization for, for development, in, in financing for development. So how can ODA be helpful in generating that change? That was, that's another quite important agenda, which I think we, we need to, uh, to, to take to heart. Then uh, maybe just to 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 finish, uh, there will be an important conference coming up a few years time, financing for development in twenty twenty five, and some of these questions about the role of ODA, where it's where it fits in, what are the, the targets for interventions, which are the countries that should uh, receive ODA and why, will have to be dealt with in the run up to that conference, so that donors and that community, I think, have. Uh, aligned and have an, an opportunity to discuss and as far as possible also to coordinate our, our views on, on on that issue and I think that would be a very important fixed point and one thing that we are aware of is we start preparations now. Final point on, on ODA integrity. It's very clear that, that ODA is a strange thing. It's a concept that was invented by the DAC in 1969. It's a concept that was highlight put into the UN uh, legislation, so to speak, or the, the decision from the General Assembly in 1970, 53 years from now, almost to the day, uh, where the General Assembly uh, adopted the um, the framework of ODA and adopted the 0.7% target, which means that then that target was adopted as an international standard for what developed countries should do in support of developing countries. And at the same time, it was left to the OECD DAC to define what actually development assistance was. And for the past 54 years, we tried to do that, try to change and, and, and modify the, the definitions and reporting directives as, uh, as the world changed. And we're still in that situation. Uh, but it's also a vote of trust in the DAC from the international community that says that you we have given you a, pr a pressure intangible asset here, ODA, and you gave it, gave it to you to, to administer that. Um, and what do you do that with the whole world's eyes on you uh, and that responsibility and that accountability to the international community at large, I think is something that we need to be be aware of. Which, so it's the question of how we adapt gradually uh, as things change, uh, the concept of ODA and the way that we account for it, but we still have to do it in a way where we can say that we maintain the original spirit and the integrity of ODA. And for me, that is a, a real important thing for us because we have a, an intangible with a lot of political value. All countries feel, all members of the DAC feel that they should attain the 0.7% targets one way or another at some point in time. Uh, so the political pressure is there. Um, and we need to make sure that the value of that target is kept uh, and that we don't dilute it. So that will be one of the, I think, the main challenges for the years to come that we, that we try to maintain that integrity of OD. Thank you. Carlson, thank you very, very much. Um, extremely interesting uh, set of challenges, as, as, as you were describing it. Many of those resonate, of course, very strongly with an Irish audience. I think the the emphasis on uh, low-income countries, uh, Africa cannot pay for Ukraine and, and, and so on. Let me invite people to put questions and comments to, to Carsten. And I can kick off with couple myself, uh, the, I think there was reference last week at the at the high level meeting, uh, Carlson, to a, a strategy, a new strategy, which will come out in 2024. What kind of content do you see uh, for that strategy? Would it embrace some of the questions that you've just been talking about? That, that, that I think, uh, Mike on, uh, that, that basically is, the, the, I think, the reason we, I think it's it's a well-kept secret, but actually in 2017, there was uh, an annex to the high-level meeting outcome, which also had the chair strategy for the DAC. I must confess, I only read that after I became the chair. Uh, so it was a well-kept secret that we actually had one. So we, at the end, we said that we will renew our strategy. And I think that's the, the base. So we do have a, a, a point of departure from that, maintaining integrity, maintaining the the traditional emphasis on on the poorest countries, and I think what we try to do now is to be sure because the world has changed dramatically since uh, you did the SDGs in 2015, mm -hmm. um, and basically look at look at 
It's eight years since then. We had had Trump. We have had Brexit. We have had a financial crisis uh, in COVID, and COVID. We had Russian aggression. Now we have Gaza. So that small eight years, less than a decade, has really changed the way that we have been been, been looking at things and looking at ODA. And I think, as I said, I think the the main structure of the house is fairly good. The question is the village in which the house is situated has changed. So we need to be sure that that house mm. still fits in 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 that that village. And that would be the, the main challenge for, for, for the strategy uh, to, to contextualize uh, ODA in, in, yeah. in, a, in another world. Um, what about overall ODA levels, Carson? Uh, I mean, is it your sense that uh, the, the traditional donors will, will, will keep up their commitments? And, and what about possible new donors? I mean, one thinks of the Gulf of traditionally and um, there are other countries. Uh, I mean, China, as you say, gives relatively little in OGA terms, but it does. It clearly has resources available. I mean, wh what number one? How are the traditional donors sh shaping up? Uh, and and number two, what uh, scope is there for adding to the uh, number of donors? I think that uh, the 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 main pressure I think on traditional donors is that on, on one hand. I think we can see increasingly that the global agenda is an important one. I think the trade-off right now is between the short term, and I took a lot about Europe here, the short term uh, regional agenda in terms of Ukraine, Russia, security, our own integration processes, vis-a-vis -vis the longer term, more global agenda. Um, they have, a, of course, a crossroads on, on there where you can look at the the whole issue of, of uh, security, of migration, a number of, of, of challenges to, to, to Europe that has to be dealt with in the, in the medium and longer term. Uh, and the sooner we get to that, the more the more sure our investments will, or the more profitable in, in that language our investments will be. So I think that the, the, the main challenge is to have a discourse in the public, in political circles, in parliaments, that that actually tries to look at this in a bit longer term and in a global perspective, not being totally absorbed mm -hmm. about the short-term regional one. I think that is the main challenge. And then to have a, a good, solid analysis of how things are interrelated and interconnected in a way that makes sure that we can make the investments at the right time and in the right size. I think that is basically the argument for, 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 for ODA and to increase ODA. It's a hard political sell. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about it. Uh, but but it again, it's a question also about those who actually create the political discourse and create the political discussions. How how far can you take that? How how much can you expand the the narrative around that? I think that that would be critical. On 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 new donors, Michael was present at our first. Uh, meeting of global providers in February, just before I took over as that chair. And there is a, a, a clear ambition from the OECD DAC 32 members to increase collaboration with non-DAC members. Um, and we had uh, a lot of countries uh, present there, and we are trying actually to pursue that. Arabs is one thing, but also Indonesia, uh, Thailand, uh, Brazil have interest in in extending uh, collaboration with DAC. And DAC has a lot to offer on the technical side. How do you do development cooperation in a rational way? There's a lot of instruments that we have that we can put at the disposal of others. So I think that, that we are trying to find how can we actually get into uh, a second uh, global providers meeting. We will have a meeting uh, next year in the DAC Arab dialogue in Kuwait which we're trying to find a date for right now. So we are reaching out to all these non-traditional donors that we will tell them. The big here, the big uh, elephant in the room, of course, is China. Mm. Um, and we all have strategies on dealing with China that goes from cooperation on climate change to that we are competitors on the economic front and then we are systemic rivals on, 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 on a third dimension. So where do we have, where do we take development? Because development deals with climate change. It also deals with economic growth and competition. And it basically also deals with values 
which are the systemic uh, issues. So development cooperation is spread on, on all levels of our relationship with China. So we need to discuss how, how we intervene, how we, how we seek dialogue with China. But I think there is a good basis for it. And I think we, we, we need to reach out uh, to, 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 to China to have some discussions on the issues that are of mutual interest. And I think we can do that. Yeah. And you mentioned, Carsten, uh, security and migration among the, the challenges uh, uh, certainly facing Europe. And that in, it brings up then the, the question, the definition of ODA, because in recent years, as you know, various efforts have been made to, to bend or to soften the, the, the DAC rules. Um, I remember 20 years ago when we were both in sort of similar positions, uh, um, there were quite strict yeah, rules yeah. in those days. Um, uh, from your perspective now, how do you see the integrity of the rules? I'm not necessarily advocating that they stay <laughs> immutable, but uh, security and migration are two areas. If you like, the, you mentioned the in-donor uh, refugee costs, and then there have been efforts by the UK, for example, to soften for the present British government to soften the rules in, in, in favour of military-type expenditure. There are threats, therefore, to the, the purity of the rules. How, how do you assess those threats? It, it's obvious that, that it, as I said, it is an ongoing discussion, and there are adaptations of the rules because the world changes and the rules will have to change. So that's a natural development over time. But there's always been a pressure in, in the sense that for a number of countries, uh, they have only ODA. They don't have any other bucket of funding. Yeah. Um, some countries will have other buckets of funding, uh, so they are more relaxed on what is ODA and what is not ODA. But a number of countries uh, actually only have ODA. So whether uh, an, an investment is included in ODA or, is, or not is quite decisive for whether that investment is possible. And if you can expand ODA with yet another mm -hmm. kind of investment mm -hmm. that usually has not been ODA, it only makes it much more possible to do more on, on, on that front. And that creates, of course, uh, an, an ongoing discussion around what where the limits are. Uh, luckily, we're in a situation that we can only change the rules if all 32 members are in agreement. And that means that we spend a lot of time. On the, our last discussions on private sector instruments, we spent seven years discussing what we agreed to here in, 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 in October. That's also 100 pages of good language on how we can actually define and count ODA. So it's, 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 it, it, it also goes into the details. The DAC is thriving on reporting directives. All member states are, are doing the reporting according to those directives. And we can change those directives if we agree on it, as we did with PSI. And that the reason for that was exactly to try to, first of all, to create rules where there hadn't been rules before, but also to create rules that would incentivize the use of smaller part of ODA to leverage other kinds of funding. Um, and that was the idea around that. And then, of course, a lot of people said we need to be sure that we're not trying to, fi to finance things that are not ODA and are not naturally within ODA. So a lot of discussion on where the limits were and also the whole accountability for it and transparency of arrangements. So I think that's a good example. On, on peace and security, it's obvious that, that we do have rules. If for a peacekeeping operation, a certain percentage can be reported as ODA, it's usually a very low number. Uh, but we can always adjust that, and it's based on evidence on how big a share of a peacekeeping operation is actually dealt with dealing with issues that are traditionally ODA. Fund. So these things can be done. Uh, but but if we have to do, as I said, we, we, ha we are accountable. We're accountable to our voters that we don't cheat on yeah. where, where, where they see ODA and what, we act what it actually is. So there has to be some kind of of transparency and, and accountability there, but we're also accountable to the world at large. Uh, and we cannot, in my view, change the rules dramatically from one day to the next without losing that vote of trust and vote of confidence from the international community to us. Uh, so it, it's a balancing act where we need to adjust because the world is changing, but we also need to be sure that we adjust on the basis of the values and the criteria and the definition that we have had for decades. So yeah. it's, 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 not an, it's not an easy answer to that. Uh, but but the good thing is that, that that taking 32 countries to move very dramatically is a bit of hard sell. So all the changes will be incremental. They'll all be tested, and they'll all be try to stand the, the test of 
a political acceptance by, by 32 yeah. different governments and parliaments. Well, I remember 20 years ago that we were um, uh, hoping that maybe some additional migrant relation costs yeah. could be accepted within the ODA definition. But I remember our Swedish colleague at the time telling me, <laughs> yeah. no way that uh, they wouldn't go along with yeah. it. And yeah. of course, ironically, more recently, yeah. the Swedish government had no problem uh, yeah. um, altering the um, the 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 the, the um, uh, definition of ODA. But for instance, on in-donor refugee costs, I we we clarified those rules in 2017 after the migration crisis in Europe in 1516. We says that you can report these costs for the first 12 months. Uh, that the, the 12 months actually kick in once the refugee comes to uh, a European country. So if yeah. you go through Germany and Poland and end up in Ireland, actually it's not full 12 months in Ireland. Um, that's that's one thing. The other thing is that it's 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 basically uh, basic sustenance. So it's it's health, education, it's housing. It's not preparation for the labor market. It's not tertiary yeah. education. There are a number of rules in in the sense that that puts an eye on that. And then we also said that you know usually it would be home offices that would do the the metrics on 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 those rules. But we also said that the reporting agent, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, which submits the, the ODA uh, figures to, to the DAC, also has a responsibility to vouch for yes. the accuracy of, of, uh, of the reporting that, that takes place. So we try to put in some safeguards, uh, and then we also, of course, urge countries to be slightly conservative. There's a judgment call in, in many of these reportings, that's very clear. Uh, but, but to be slightly conservative uh, on the way that, in the way that they do the reporting. But the big thing, of course, is whether the 2023 data will be at the same level of the 2022 data. In 2022, we saw uh, an increase in assistance to Ukraine going up from 1 billion in 21 to 16 billion by natural assistance in 22. We saw a surge in, in, in Indonesia refugee costs moving from, I think, $16 billion over and all in 21 to almost $30 billion in 2022. Now, that was, of course, everybody could understand that. Ukrainian refugees coming into Europe and ex exceptional circumstances and, and exceptional situations. So we we all had to uh, cope with that. Now the the number of Ukrainians have decreased. Maybe other uh, asylum seekers and, and refugees are moving into Europe at the same time. So we will see when we get to 2023 numbers in April, whether this huge level of in-donor refugee cost is actually still the same in 23 as it was in 22, well or whether it's going down or how much it's going down. It, it peaked before in 20, 15, 16, then it went down again in 17, 18, and, and up again in 22. So it's, it's cyclical in, 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 in many ways, but responding to crisis situations. But, but we will need to see, and we also then need to see whether we, we have to take this issue up again in a discussion in the dark. Yeah. Um, the OECD generally and the DAG have done great work on accountability and transparency. And I have a question here about the, the private um, investments framework. Um, so how do you see the cooperation between DAC and the private sector generally? I think that, that if, if we take uh, as point of departure that we, that we need more private finance in, in order to, deal, to, to reach the SDGs. We cannot do that with uh, ODA alone. Uh, domestic resources will still be the most important source of financing for development, but domestic resources need to be supplemented with more investments, more trading opportunities. If you take an African country, then you say, okay, can we inject more uh, private investment that can in, uh, bring a lot of benefits to a country? Can we basically develop more trading opportunities? Can we reach the, the content level of products and, and the uh, basically the value added of products that, that goes for sales from, from African countries to Europe, it all has a, a, a great meaning to use ODA for that. But it has to be, it, it, we have to walk the thin line between this being a necessary incentive to doing things and not being um, basically a subsidy for what you are, are already doing. And I think that's the thin line that, that, that's at, at the basis of all this. Um, and we don't want to create, you know, no subsidy competition between yes. European countries using ODA to the best possible. We need to limit the, this use to where it's actually necessary in order to, to make the investment. We have a lot of discussion about risks. Um, there's, there are country risks, 
there are currency risks, there are project risks. Uh, and, and on project risk, the sense is that uh, we need, and that's also one of the things from the high level meeting communique, we need to look a bit more on, on the way that we assess risks. The sense is that some of the data that we have on risk will contradict the popular assumption that, that risks are very high. So the, the notion is that we have we need more transparency on, on these data. And, and then we need maybe also to have a discussion with the rating agencies on, on this, because there is uh, maybe a perception out there, and that's the indication that the assumption for the work that we're going to take on this, that, that, that uh, an overestimation of the risk level that, that means that a lot of investments do not take place because the risk is set too high. Mm. And if we can set the risk more realistically, maybe we can we can actually make more investments happen. And that's it's not a, a, an ODA issue per se, but it is basically an issue where ODA will play a role in de-risking and bringing down risk, um, and also in in, uh, in in funding of a lot of the development finance institutions. So uh, we do have uh, an interest in, in in that specific level, but just one one final note on this: that that what we what we what did we with the agreement on on private sector instrument was also to say we now set in motion a system for reporting, uh, and we will review this system again in a few years' time when we have more data. It cannot be done tomorrow because it takes time to to make this new system work. But we actually will try to review that in twenty thirty. And see whether these things that are that we have put in motion how how they actually worked. And we also given the secretariat a bit more clout to engage with member states if they see things that are basically, you know, very strange uh, in the way that that uh, that member states do reporting on 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 ODA on on private sector instruments. So there's also a more assertive role for the secretariat in in these discussions in, as part of the agreement. You're absolutely right about the SDGs financing. I mean, we only ever envisage that OTA would be more or less a drop of the ocean, that in the, the, the needs of this vast agenda would require a huge investment by the private sector. And, and uh, sometimes that is lost sight of, that uh, uh, it, it was never going to rely entirely on, on OTA. Um, the, the the question of the, the partnership with Africa, Carson, can you say a little bit more about that? Because in many ways, uh, you know, it's it, not only do we want to make sure that Africa is not uh, disproportionately affected by the current crisis as it is, but I think it makes sense that the DAC would reach out to uh, to the low-income countries in, in, in Africa. How do you intend to go ahead with that? I, 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 I think that that that's that's a discussion we can have in the DAC, but it's also important that that discussion is also taking in, in all member states, yeah. uh, because if if we somehow if we still maintain, I think we should that the main emphasis on ODA should be on low income countries, LDCs yeah. and other low income countries. The majority of those are in Africa. Those LDCs that you find in other places in Africa are on their way to graduation from the LDC status. So it's very much, if you look at what we can call poor countries, least developed countries, low-income countries, the, the bulk of that is in Africa. It's also where we have a huge demographic challenge and a huge economic challenge. Uh, and, and, and also basically where the, the, the issue of, of, of migration, of irregular flows of migrants, where the issue of, of security in terms of risking uh, terrorist uh, activities and, and hotbeds uh, in, in, in right outside the European frontier, uh, where the whole issue of, of instability uh, is, is, is most urgent. We see the, the, the numbers of, of, of our demographics that Africa will double its population from 2020 to 2050. The majority of young people in this world will, will be living in Africa in 2050. Uh, so there has to be jobs, there has to be economic opportunity, and 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 we have an interest in in assisting African countries move, making that move in order to be able to cope with increased population and create pathways for young people that can either stay in country or leave in a part of regular migration schemes mm -hmm. or whatever they want to do and what we what we can negotiate in times to come. So I think that that Africa would need to be the main emphasis. Um, 
challenge, of course, is that Africa, if you look at it from a climate change perspective, Africa is less than 4% of all global emissions. So from a climate change perspective, mitigation issues are not a very high on the agenda of Africa. Adaptation is. How can you, because climate change will happen, we saw the new numbers from, 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 the, from the UN the other day, change will happen, it will affect uh, livelihood, precipitation patterns and livelihoods for a number of African countries. So there will be a lot of change in African, in, in African countries due to climate change, and adaptation to that will be a key issue for, for, for ODA. And that's the reason that we have a, an ongoing discussion about the balance between mitigation and adaptation. Because at the end of the day, this is also a discussion about middle-income countries, which would benefit much more for investments in, in mitigation, and low-income countries that would benefit much more from an investment in adaptation. So that knows that balance and this and the strive to increase the relative share of adaptation in ODA, I think is, is hugely important. Uh, but it, it's something that we have to deal with, and it's something that that uh, I think adds to the the emphasis of Africa because the link, we have an HDP nexus, humanitarian development peace, which we OCD formalized in 2019, which basically says that we need to be more coordinated with our humanitarian systems, our development systems, and our political diplomacy systems. So those three systems that we all have need to be more integrated in the way we approach mm. situations in countries. Now we also need to be sure that we take care of climate change issues in that nexus, mm. not as a fourth pillar, but integrated across the nexus. I think that would be a real challenge for us. And that would also mean that that somehow we it's also a way to mitigate the pressure from climate, from humanitarian, on development, on the core of development cooperation. If we can through the HCP nexus and the integrated approach to climate change can bring these things Thanks together more together and and avoid this kind of of pressures that 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 that, that pressures on the core of development. Thank you, Carsten. Let me um, advise any questions from the audience. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Are there? Um, Jill. Thank you very much, Carson, and thank you for a really fascinating presentation. Um, just to pick you up there on the uh, diplomacy and diplomatic systems, you've become the face of uh, of uh, the DAC um, uh, and the recent report on PSIs as well, I think was very well received. And I know that you, you move around a lot to various countries. I was wondering when you were talking about get, getting new members uh, for the DAC, whether the association of um, uh, a reputation for a positive reputation for um, accountability and uh, involvement in the DAC is something which assists you, for example, in non like minded countries uh, where we might not share the same value systems politically, but in terms of the DAC, that there is a benefit for them in being seen and being peer reviewed um, but, uh, globally, basically, and um, that might um, assist you in your diplomatic efforts. Thank you. It's a it's a really good good uh, set of questions. Um, the DAC membership is limited to countries that are members of the OECD, so we have a limited number of countries that are, can be members of the DAC. Of OECD members, six are not members of the DAC. It goes for Israel and Turkey, and it goes for the four Latin American countries that we have as members: mm -hmm. Chile, Colombia, uh, Costa Rica. Uh, and uh, which is the last one, Mexico, of course, the longest serving of those members. Those four are not members of the DAC. And the reason that they are not is that they have traditionally also been members of the G77, and they have traditionally also been identifying as developing countries. To, to, so to make the move, even if you have become a member of the OECD, to make the move from that to be actually in a donors club yeah. has not taken place yet. But, but what we have done now is that we also have created the status of, of associate in the DAC. So we can actually become a DAC member with voting rights. We don't vote, but basically with the full rights, even if you're not a member of the OECD. And that's something that we just decided a few months ago. And the interest of that, of course, is to see whether we can find others that will actually do that. And some have, have indicated a certain interest in, 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 in that. Uh, very preliminary, of course, but but basically to go for 
their, their donor activities go get closer to the duck and, and join the duck, duck work. And we we very very interested and very open to uh, to, to 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 do that. Um, whether it will transpire, we I, I don't know, but 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 uh, I'm hopeful that that we can we can get in that direction. Uh, but it's there's still a lot of old north south uh, atmospherics around yeah. <laughs> around the OECD uh, around the duck. The OECD is now still very much the rich countries club. Okay, Colombia is a member, so it may be not that rich, uh, but 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 still, the, the, that kind of atmospheric is still there, and it's very much the, the the case with the duck. But reaching out to other providers of ODA, also to, we had discussions with with Indonesia the other day, and they have interest in maybe exploring this kind of associate status with the duck. They're still a, a huge recipient of of not least climate related assistance from from duck members, but they also have their own development program. So that's double identity here as both, both being yeah. a recipient and a donor, uh, which is I think is is maybe the answer to the complexities of this world that you you can be both things at the same time, um, and I think we need we need to encourage that and we want to encourage that. So I I think we get a, a less. My hope is that we get a world that is much more confusing. Than it is today because I don't like this kind of north south divide. I think there's yeah. it it ha it hampers us utilizing yeah. all the the little things that can combine all the countries of this world, and 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 we, I don't want to create the kind of traditional north south divide that we saw in the seventies and eighties when we go to conferences north and south. Uh, but I do hope that that the complexity of the world and the fact that that a lot of the middle income countries are moving quickly upward. And becoming basically what we see is if you look at China, China is a developing country today. China will reach the average level of the cutoff point for ODA within the next few years. We don't know exactly when, yeah. it depends on World Bank data. But if you have a DNI per capita around $13,000 a year, you will graduate from being an ODA recipient. Uh, that's, that's the rules. Um, and China will reach that point within a few years. And at, at some point in time, over the next I don't know, five, six, seven years, we will actually probably take a decision that China is no longer no longer eligible for development assistance if we look at the numbers that we now have. Uh, and that's that's uh, that's basically looking just looking at uh, how how things will develop in in in, in the economies. Uh, and that would basically create a new situation uh, around one of the big players in, in, in the global economy. Um, and it, but it also illustrates the complexities of which countries are which. Uh, Pradit Sakavia, I think it was, made this book about the rise of the rest. Mm -hmm. And that is basically what we have seen in, in recent years and what we continue to see that a number of developing countries, emerging power economies will actually in, increase their economic growth considerably. And change the way that the, the jigsaw puzzle of the world will, 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 will be looking quite different. Uh, and uh, the, that division north-south will be splintered and 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 re replaced by a much mm. more, much different world. Uh, and somehow we need to make sure that the concept of ODA will fit into that and that the emphasis on the poor countries, on the low-income countries, on those groups of people in these countries that have no recourse to other finance, finance and, uh, and support that they get through ODA will still be the main targets uh, yeah. for assistance. Great, Carlson. I'm on favor over time now. We'll probably have to bring it to a halt. Um, uh, unless there are any, I suspect that you have to go to your next appointment. That's why. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Carson, for making yourself available uh, this morning at the, at the Institute. We've really uh, benefited hugely from your presentation and from the um, at the the Q and A session now. Um, I hope you'll come again, and um, and um, I think you have lots of friends in Ireland, and we uh, wish you well in your new role, and uh, for which you're ideally suited. So best of luck. Thank you.